Hello and welcome to another episode of Brother Nature. Today we'll be investigating the beautiful Atherton Tablelands just west of Cairns. An area that even the legendary David Attenborough named as one of his favourites. The Tablelands are also famous for its agriculture, everything ranging from dairy right through to avocados. But more importantly for us, it's an area famous for its flora and fauna, absolutely dripping in unique species. So let's go take an adventure and see what we can get. So this is me taking a quick safety photo in case he bolts up the tree, but we were welcomed to the area by this beautiful character. The Boyd's Forest Dragon happens to be one of the most iconic reptiles in Australia, never mind the wet tropics. So I'll forgive you for thinking, what is this nutter up to? Well, in actual fact, I'm pretending to be a bush pig or a turkey, something like that, just looking for insects in the leaf litter. This gets the attention of the dragon. But what I have to be careful of is to not make eye contact. If I were to, he'd spook and bolt up the tree and I'd miss him. So this is me maneuvering gently, getting into a position close enough to be able to then pounce on him. Here. So tell us a bit about this guy. This is Boyd's Forest Dragon. Wow. Look at him. Oh, the colour on this one's spectacular. Territorial male. Great definition in the crest. This is uh, so. Can I ask why? Sorry. Hmm. Why do you? How do you know it's a male? Just the pronounced crest. That's right. Colour. A female's far less pronounced she's uh -huh. a bit more bland in color hopefully we'll find a female he will generally reside in a territory which is popular with females so i'm sure there's probably one watching us right now from somewhere mm. wow. it's incredible well that's done awesome. babe wow we've got some sticks yeah. all right another really interesting thing i find about these boyd's dragons um they're one of two uh, the Hypsilorus genus, so they're, they're you know, one of two dragons that look like this in Australia. There's its cousin down in southeast Queensland, the southern angle-headed dragon. But um, this guy's just so much more elaborate than the southern angle head. The spines on the crest here are far more pronounced, like you can see these uh, lateral spines across the, the back here. Just an absolutely beautiful species. The, quite interesting thing about these guys is they're not a species that will typically go bask in sunny patches of light like you'd expect with most other uh, lizards. He'll actually just thermoregulate with the ambient air temperature instead of actually seeking hot spots in the forest. If you're interested in finding these guys, generally speaking a nice open rainforest with lots of young saplings and close to water basically that's there's obviously exceptions to the rule you can find them in in any uh, tropical wet rainforest between or oh, sort of just north of Townsville right up to uh, Cape Trib any of that wet wet forest area but you've got to really look out keep your eyes peeled and listen as well it's really important you listen because these guys have a knack for just being sat on a little uh, sapling like this but they will shift around as they see a potential threat in the forest he will go from being sat there to there to there and he'll hide from you he'll disguise so you have to be very keen eyed and keen eared to find the Boyd's dragon because they rarely spook so you could be stood right beside this dragon and in this forest they're just so uh, camouflage and we really really love him he is spectacular so we'll take a moment get some steals cool.
All right, for those of you out there who love turtles like I do, if you're keen on seeing new species and things like that and interested in going for a bit of a snorkel, it definitely pays to look in the deeper pools with lots of cover. They really like to hug the bottom, but then also those trees and things that have fallen off the bank that provide really good cover, basking spots for sunning themselves and obviously cover from predating birds. They're the places to look. Get in amongst those root systems and you'll find more than you think. As you can see from that photo, I'm pretty chuffed with myself as this was a new species, the Sterling Snapping Turtle, a species only found in the local area of the North and South Johnson River systems. All right, so moving on to some spotlighting and we've discovered this beautiful crest glider. Now you could easily be fooled for thinking that this was a sugar glider and I've made that very mistake in the past myself. But a study in 2020 taxonomically differentiated these and split them into three species. The savannah glider, sugar and crefts. This happens to be the crefts and it's differentiated by the dorsal stripe running down its back and a white tip to its tail. Morning nature nutters, we're incredibly fortunate. We have found this beautiful little pink tongue lizard this morning. Now this is a fantastic species because it's not one you typically bump into very often. Because they're an arboreal skink and they're living up in the tree canopy, obviously when you look in that dense rainforest, it's very easy to miss these guys. We've been really fortunate he's come down to the ground to catch some sun this morning, probably uh, feeding on the last of the evening snails and things. But this is a nice juvenile one. He's got uh, some very faint barring but he's quite dark like this, so as he can catch the beautiful sunshine, that radiation. There's so little sun available here that he has to make the most of the sun he can catch to warm up in the day. Now being a juvenile, he's actually still got a blue tongue because he is actually related to the blue tongues, although he is a different uh, genus, which is Carpomorpheus. As he matures, he'll lighten up in color but that tongue will go from blue to pink as well. I think that's quite interesting. Anyway, this is the beautiful little pink tongue skin. Not only from being arboreal and spending most of their life up in the trees, they're quite difficult to find as well because they're so incredibly quiet. As you'll see from the footage here, they have a tendency to fold their legs back and almost swim through their habitat minimizing that contact and therefore the noise that they create they can be incredibly stealthy i must say on review this happens to be my favorite bit of footage of this animal seeing that beautiful blue tongue with that incredible uh, spongy tip sampling his environment as he heads back up into the treetops I'm going to actually uh, put a blow up of that tongue so as you can see for yourself. What have we got, babe? Nice little leaves in the mouth, don't you, down by the edge of the tree.
All right, nature nutters, here's a curiosity. This is the Lumholtz tree kangaroo, an Australian species I feel that definitely doesn't get the notoriety and credit it deserves, like koalas and platypus and things like that. Now, we're obviously all accustomed to seeing large groups of kangaroos bouncing through paddocks and grasslands, but you don't associate kangaroos, therefore, with living in trees. Well, I certainly didn't. To find them right up in the treetops, and I mean 120 feet off the ground, is quite uh, unusual. As you can see here, very uh, comfortable just chewing on these leaf tips. Oh, and I've got to stay. I was astonished and surprised at how agile they are, given how stocky and robust they are. Their ability in the treetops to counterbalance with their tail. Then on a windy day, they could still do it. As you can see, balancing on these thin limbs without concern. Oh, and to see the way they slid down tree trunks like firemen down a fire pole, that was also quite amazing. Now, no doubt by the audio you can tell that there's plenty of cars zooming by. This is because this is Peasons Creek down in the township of Yungaburra, a fantastic place to go see not only the tree kangaroos, but also platypus. Now, I'll confess, I found this pretty convenient because I had spent numerous nights driving around only to get fleeting glimpses of eye shine. As soon as I'd try and approach to get any sort of footage or photo, they would spook and bolt. Not a species that really enjoys being approached at all. Very wary of humans, typically. But as I was saying, down at Peasons Creek, there's a male that resides there with a harem of females, and thankfully they're very approachable as they have a tendency to have large numbers of guests being guided there up from Cairns for the weekend. And I'm quite thankful that they've become a customer of people because it gave us this rather rare opportunity to get some nice clean footage without them really being concerned about our presence. Whilst you watch this bit of footage, note their claws. I think they resemble sloths, not just in looks, but in the manner in which they use them too. And this is actually another fine example of sharing with other naturalists as well. I shared the location of these tree kangaroos and in return I was given the location of some lovely sooty owl chicks that I'll share with you later on. Now something that I learnt that I find particularly interesting about tree kangaroos is with their strictly leafy diet, which encompasses 72 different species of plants in their area, a lot of them aren't these really nutritious things that you'd expect. Some of them are quite noxious poisonous plants meaning that on occasions they'll leave the treetops, particularly at night, to go down creek banks and other exposed banks to find a substance within the clay of those banks called kaolin. They ingest that kaolin, which binds with the poisons in their digestive system, and allows them to pass it out through their waste instead of it entering their bloodstream. So this sequence of photos shot just on dusk definitely display a bit of that amorous behaviour. Lots of sniffing, lots of grappling. Unfortunately though, she wasn't ready. She denied him every single time. And there's one last thing I should mention. Lumholtz is not the only tree kangaroo. There's a rarer species up north, the Bennett's tree kangaroo. We're heading that way. We're hoping to find it for you. So fingers crossed guys. Right, morning nature nutters. As you can see we have another specimen of the Boyd's dragon here. Although I think it's another adolescent male, this is quite indicative of uh, how the females look as well. This less pronounced crest with probably only about three smaller spines. He's displaying some colour in the chin so I do still think that it's a, a young male. And I'm just going to pull it out a little bit. You can see if he would have displayed or a female, he uh, pulls this um, lobe under his chin out to display and he'll head nod and stuff but another beautiful Boyd's dragon.
Adventure Nutters just taking a bit of a walk in the forest and this is a real pleasure. This is a rare treat during the day. This is the Collared Delma, one of those beautiful legless lizards that you've seen in past episodes. I've not seen one of these in about 15 years so I'm pretty happy to find this guy. All right, I'll pause here for a minute because over what is actually more like 25 years, I totally forgot what the collar delmas actually look like, although the differences are quite subtle. This turns out to be the Atherton delma, delma motella, a uh, vulnerable species and a new one for me at that, so stoked as. Look at the beautiful yellow tone under that stomach. Yet again, not much to show for the little uh, feet at the base here. Another species that's very, very timid, cryptic, moving through the leaf litter very silently, obviously trying to avoid being predated on by the birds overhead. Yeah, real pleasure to find during the day, the collar delma. We'll take some stills and uh, show you those in greater detail. He's looking perfect. Welcome back to another night in the wet tropics, guys. This is an absolute trophy find. I'm so happy with my wife right now. She has found me my trophy species. This is the chameleon gecko. The sole member of the genus, which is Carphodactylus. Very, very similar to the leaf tail geckos with the toes and the head structure. But look at this tail. This beautiful sort of odd carrot shaped tail. And oh, just such a spectacular gecko. I just love this thing. I've wanted to see these guys for ages. The interesting thing about these guys is they're very prone to dropping this tail. And it's said that they drop it and when it rides around in the leaf litter, it'll make a squeaking noise to attract, I guess, the predator that it's trying to therefore uh, escape. Another common uh, thing about these geckos, if you're not finding them on the ground, like we did this evening, you generally find them just on a young sapling tree like this, facing downwards in that sort of ambush pattern, waiting to uh, attack their invertebrate prey. Anyway, we'll take this opportunity to get some nice stills and you'll see those. But the chameleon gecko. Besides all the stunning wildlife, the other really good thing about the Atherton Tablelands is the sheer number of other naturalists getting around. The reason I say that is the more eyes out there, people spotlighting like us, and the more information being shared, the more we're all accumulatively being able to find. And this is a classic example of what I mean. We'd been shared the location of this beautiful lumpy satin ash that had pygmy possums by another couple that we'd met in the forest. We'd also been shared the location of the yellow belly gliders and the sooty owls as well. So being out there, being in amongst it, you meet other naturalists and you exchange stories, photos and locations and it really pays off. So the night we were given the location of this lumpy satin ash, we arrived there to find another naturalist there who had already had some time and observed the pygmy possums. So. 
we actually developed a really good relationship. Uh, Ian's been a very good friend and we've spent a lot of time out in the bush uh, doing various bits of work. Now, it's very easy to think that through the power of editing that you'd think that this was all just one session, this bit of video here of the pygmy possum and the numerous photos to follow. But this is an accumulation of many, many nights spent in the forest, keenly waiting for this very cryptic, shy little uh, possum to feel comfortable enough with our presence to be able to come out. There were nights where there was just too much moonlight and he was very nervous and wouldn't leave the cover of the wait a while. And then on the other hand, the moment you lifted a foot and disturbed the leaf litter, he would hear it, the flash going off. <laughs> if you changed the angle of the light, he would detect it and he'd scurry off. Now you can see here from this bit of footage that Mariella got incredibly fortunate. This was the longest lasting interaction with this uh, possum that we had the entire time. I think we probably spent eight or nine nights and this was the best bit of footage we could get. The long-tailed pygmy possum, which this one is, Circadius cordatus, is one of four in the genus. He's the only one found in the northern region up here. You've got a big area without any before you then get into the southern and western species. But I feel incredibly fortunate to have seen this animal. It was a uh, really humbling experience to spend time with this little character getting about doing his business. It's said that they're primarily insectivorous, but I think it's safe to say during the winter months when insect levels are low, they're going to turn to this high energy source from the nectar and that becomes their primary diet through the winter. After those several nights that we did spend on this tree observing this animal, he strictly stuck to it. He wasn't going off foraging looking for insects and things, he was restricted to this tree. He was loving it. It provided such a good fuel source that he just simply wasn't going to leave it. And I'm glad that was the case because it did mean that he was there for us to continually observe. I think if I had been here in the summer when other trees were flowering perhaps and there was lots of insect activity that I would have got a simple fleeting glimpse of this animal at best, if at all. So the fact that he was here constantly feeding on the lumpy ash Oh, which is so beneficial for us. There's something I find really interesting. As I process the images, I notice their fingers and toes have these really cool little retractable claws. Check it out. I think the other point I need to make as well is it's beneficial for both of them. The lumpy satin ash definitely got some high quality pollination from this character. As you'll see from these photos of both animals, the striped possum and the long-tailed pygmy possum, that they were doing a fantastic job pollinating every single flower on it. I should also note that there were other species visiting this tree besides the ants and the bats. There were also little bandicoots coming down at ground level and taking advantage. It really was a hive of activity. It was great to see. All right, beautiful people. Sadly, that brings us to the end of another episode. So I'll leave you here with all the photos of all the other beautiful animals we found. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all the other naturalists that we bumped into who were kind enough to share locations and the things they've seen with us. Particularly a very kind gentleman the name of Alan Galanders from Alan's Wildlife Tours. His expertise in the area is second to none and he was so kind as to share various locations and all sorts of things with us. You know, it's his bread and butter yet he was kind enough just to willingly share that information with me. So I'm really appreciative. And if you find yourself in the Atherton Tablelands, be sure to take a tour with Alan. And another point I should make is I took thousands of photos that got shortlisted to 350 and a fraction of those made it into the episode. So keeping that in mind, there's plenty, plenty more to see than what you'll see in this doco. All right, the last thing is to keep an eye out for the upcoming episodes, a particularly good one on gliders and how to find them. Another on the beautiful northern leaf tail gecko, perhaps some platypus stuff. Anyway, if you've made it this far, thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.